All right, welcome back. Uh, let's get this lecture started with a matching exercise. We're going to match benign breast disease diseases with their correct features. So go ahead and hit that pause button and then try and figure this out. And come on back when you think you've got everything correct and then we will discuss. All right, so here is the correct matches. If you need to fix anything, go ahead and hit the pause button. Um, otherwise, let's look at the important benign diseases of the breast that we need to know for our exam. So let's start at the top here. Um, let's start with fibrocystic changes, which are normal in women between 20 and 50 years of age who are premenopausal. Now, the way you'll see this presenting is with pain that occurs premenstrual or the presence of lumps that show up premenstrual. Now, it's always good to know if this sort of thing is more common unilaterally or bilaterally. So what do you think? Well, fibrocystic, fibrocystic changes tend to occur bilaterally. They're also, also going to be multifocal. So those are a couple uh, key uh, pieces of information that can help you to determine whether we're dealing with this or something else. Typically, these lesions are nothing more than simple cysts, but they can also be papillary apocrine changes or metaplasia, as well as stromal fibrosis. And these aren't typically going to increase one's risk of developing cancer. Now, we've got a couple of important subtypes we need to know, including the sclerosing adenosis and epithelial hyperplasia. So sclerosing adenosis is characterized by a sinai in stromal fibrosis and is associated with calcifications. Now, this may be associated with a slight increase for cancer. The epithelial hyperplasia subtype is characterized by cells in the lobular epithelium or the terminal ducts, and if there is presence of atypical cells, that does increase the risk of carcinoma development. Next up, we've got the inflammatory processes, which include fat necrosis and lactational mastitis. Now, fat necrosis is super high yield and commonly tested, and this is a benign lesion that occurs as a result of trauma to the breast. On mammography, this will look like a calcified oil cyst, and on biopsy, you'll see um, necrosing fat in giant cells. Now, the other condition under this umbrella is lactational mastitis, which you could probably guess is going to be linked to breastfeeding. Now, during breastfeeding, the nipples tend to dry out and crack, and if this happens, there's an increased risk of a bacterial infection getting through these cracks. Now, what do you think it's going to be the most common pathogen associated with this condition. Well, if you said Staph aureus, excellent job. Now, if this happens, what do we do? Do we discontinue breastfeeding or do we keep breastfeeding? The answer is we keep breastfeeding and we treat with antibiotics. Now, of course, we only continue breastfeeding if it's not so painful that mom can continue doing so, but it is safe is, is basically what I'm trying to say here. So. Now let's take a look at some of the benign tumors, including the fibroadenoma, the interductal papilloma, and the phylloides tumor. So first, the fibroadenoma is a small, well-defined and mobile mass that is most likely to be seen in someone under 35 years of age. Now, if you look at the tumor under a microscope, you're going to be able to see fibrous tissue and glands. Now, this is sensitive to estrogen changes, and so when a woman, a woman is premenstrual or if she's pregnant, the size will increase as will the tenderness. So that's important to keep in mind too. Now, although this is a headache to have, this doesn't increase one's risk of developing cancer. And so that's always important to tell your patient. Next, we have the interductal papilloma, which is a small fibroepithelial tumor within the lactiferous ducts, usually found beneath the areola. Now, if a patient presents with nipple discharge, be it blood or be it a serious discharge, this is likely, or this is not likely, this is going to be your most common cause. So I always want you to keep that in mind on your exam. Now, do you think that this is associated with an increased risk of cancer? The answer is yes, but only slightly. Next is our phylloides tumor, which is a larger lesion that's composed of connective tissue and cysts that have leaf-like lobulations. Now, you're most likely going to see this in someone in their 50s. Now, just like the interductal papilloma, this does have the potential to become malignant. Now, the last benign lesion we're gonna cover here is gynecomastia. Now, this is when breast tissue in a male enlarges and that happens as a result of increased estrogen activity. Now, this can be normal, which we'd call physiologic, in newborns, adolescents, as well as in elderly men. Now, non-physiologic causes of the development of gynecomastia can include cirrhosis of the liver, 
hypogonism, uh, tumors of the testicles, as well as certain drugs. Okay, now there's a mnemonic called some hormones create funny knockers. That is um, SHCFK. That helps you remember which drugs can cause gynecomastia. And this represents spironolactone. That could be prescribed for which condition? Could be prescribed for hypertension or even uh, heart failure. Hormones, of course, you know, any type of hormones. Uh, cimetidine, which belongs to which class of medications? Cimetidine is an H2 receptor blocker. And what do we use cimetidine for? Hopefully you said GERD as well as ulcers. Finasteride, talked about this one a lot. What kind of drug, um, what category of drug is finasteride? Hopefully you said it's a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. We talked about this a lot. Why is it prescribed? Well, there's two reasons. One, which I probably talked about more, was uh, to prevent hair loss in men. The other is for BPH. And the last one is ketoconazole, which is of course an antifungal. All right, let's move on and talk about breast cancer. Let's start with a multiple choice question. So go ahead and hit that pause button, try to figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer here is B. Now, before we go to the different types of breast cancer, let's look at some of the basics we need to know. First, remember that breast cancer is more commonly going to occur in postmenopausal women and is most likely to present with a hard, palpable mass in the upper outer quadrant of the breast. Now, invasive forms of breast cancer beco can become fixed to the pec muscle, as well as the deep fascia, the Cooper's ligament, and the overlying skin. Now, if the lesion fixes to the overlying skin, you should look for dimpling or nipple retraction. And of course, that's depending on where it's found. Now, in which anatomical structure of the breast does breast cancer usually arise? This is important. It typically arises in the terminal duct lobular unit. Don't forget that the overamplification of estrogen and progesterone receptors, or CERBB2, is common, and the presence of what we call triple negative breast cancer, meaning ER negative, PR negative, and HER2 new negative, is going to be an extremely aggressive form of breast cancer. Now, some of the risk factors that you need to be on the lookout for when breast cancer is suspected would include increased age, Remember, it's most often seen in postmenopausal women, a family history of breast cancer, a history of finding atypical hyperplasia, of course, mutations of the BRCA1 or BRCA2 genes, obesity. Remember, fat tissue will convert androstenedione dione into estrone, um, no history of breastfeeding, history of alcohol intake, increased total number of menstrual cycles, and the last one is an increased exposure to estrogen. Now, something interesting about race that you should keep in mind is that the race with the greatest risk of getting breast cancer is which? It's the Caucasian race. However, African Americans have the greatest risk of triple negative breast cancer, which I just mentioned, is very aggressive. Now, the last big picture detail that I want to touch on before we move into the specific types of breast cancer has to do with the most important prognostic factor. Do you know what that would be? This is super high yield, so make sure you remember this. The most important prognostic factor would be the status of the axillary lymph node metastasis. Have um, cancer cells moved into the axillary lymph nodes? If so, that is not good. If not, that is good. All right, let's move on to our next question, which is a matching exercise. We're going to start talking about um, breast cancers. The first one here is non-invasive carcinomas. So match the, the correct non-invasive carcinoma with the correct feature. Come on back when you think you've got everything right, and we'll talk about each type. All right. Here we go with the correct answers here. Now, if you need to pause and fix anything, go ahead. Otherwise, let's look at our non-invasive carcinomas of the breast. This, in, this is going to include ductal carcinoma in situ, Paget disease, and lobular carcinoma in situ. So first, ductal carcinoma in situ is a type of non-invasive breast cancer that fills the ductal lumen, and it arises from ductal atypia. Now, mammography oftentimes demonstrates microcalcifications early on in the disease process. 
Now there's a subtype known as DCIS. This is known as comedocarcinoma. This is characterized by cells with high-grade nuclei with extensive central necrosis and dystrophic calcification. Now Paget disease is going to present with very specific findings, which is that scaly, raw, uh, vesicular, or ulcerated lesions that begin on the nipple and spread to the areola. Now you may also notice in this type of cancer that there's bloody discharge, but it's not the most common cause of discharge. Now one of the ways you can get clearer on this as a diagnosis, of course, is by the fact that it is often unilateral, not bilateral. So patients, in addition to that unilateral presentation, also tend to complain of pain, burning, and itching. This is caused by an extension of underlying DCIS or invasive breast cancer up the lactiferous ducts and into the skin of the nipple. The last one here is the lobular carcinoma in situ, and this is something we'll find incidentally on biopsy because this is interesting, it doesn't present with mass or with calcifications. Now, since this doesn't present with a lot of findings, one of the things that you could be asked about is the association with e-cadherent expression, which in this condition is going to be decreased. Remember that e-cadherent helps to maintain the structure and integrity of the epithelium. This is also associated with an increased risk of cancer in either breast. All right, let's move on to our next question. We are doing a matching exercise for invasive carcinoma. So go ahead and match the invasive carcinoma with this correct feature, and then come on back when you think you've got everything correct. All right, here are your correct answers. If you need to pause and uh, correct anything, go ahead. Otherwise, let's talk about the invasive carcinomas of the breast, which will include invasive ductal carcinoma, invasive lobular carcinoma, medullary carcinoma, and inflammatory carcinoma. First up, the most common type of invasive breast cancer is the invasive ductal carcinoma. Now, this is characterized by an extremely hard fibrous mass with sharp margins. It's also characterized by small, glandular duct-like cells in desmoplastic stroma. Next up is the invasive lobular carcinoma, which similarly to the lobular carcinoma in situ is also associated with a decreased expression of e cadherin This cancer is often seen bilaterally and with multiple lesions located in the same area. Now the medullary type is interesting because it oftentimes is confused for being a fibroadenoma. So this lesion is large and it's characterized by anaplastic cells that grow in sheets with associated lymphocytes and plasma cells. And the last one here is the inflammatory carcinoma, which has a poor prognosis at just 50% survival rate at five years. Now unique to this invasive carcinoma is the fact that it often doesn't present with a palpable mass, but rather looks similar to either Paget disease or mastitis. This is characterized by dermal lymphatic space invasion that results in the patient presenting with pain in the breast and warm, swollen, erythematous skin around exaggerated hair follicles. All right, that's the end of this lecture. Let's move on to the next lecture, which will discuss some male pathology.